guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. To the profession of medicine, to the men and women who labor in its cause, this story is dedicated. Tonight's presentation, the field of hematology, science of blood. The object in point, a piece of jagged glass. The case in point, David Carter Stinson. He's 11 years old. From the day he was born, his life's been in constant jeopardy. A simple cut, an unlucky fall, a bruise. Any of these could mean death for him. His condition is sometimes referred to as the royal disease, the malady of kings. But David's not a king. He's just a young boy in a lot of trouble. David, tell the class who captured Mexico City and when. David? David, are you listening? In November 1519, Hernando Cortez marched on the Aztec capital, Mexico City. The Emperor Montezuma, thinking he was a descendant of the sun god, offered no resistance. And in a short time, Cortez controlled all Mexico. Same as Walker, did they ever find those little men that landed near Cuernavaca? Little men? David, is that in your copy of Mexico, Land of Sunshine and Manana? No, it's in Science Weekly Report, Miss Walker. They came by saucer. <laughs> Class? <laughs> David, try to stay with the text. Anyway, they couldn't have come to Cuernavaca. There isn't an airport within miles. And now, Class? Tomorrow, we'll cover the principal industries and major cities. This is David Stinson. And this room has been the boundary of his world for more than two months. No great disaster put him there. He simply fell off a bike and bumped his knee. For most boys, the treatment would have been a piece of adhesive tape and a chocolate soda. But for David, it meant two weeks in a hospital, four pints of blood, an orthopedic brace, and agonizing pain whenever he moves his leg. But David Carter Stinson is a hemophiliac. He's a bleeder. When he cuts himself, it doesn't stop. And it takes all the arts of medicine to keep his heart from pumping his life out through the open wound. And this is his mother. From the day David was born, it's been her job to say no. No bicycle. No baseball. No football. No running. No jumping. Almost every normal interest the boy could have, it's been her job to say no. But she watches over him fiercely, torn with two emotions, love and guilt. The guilt, she blames herself for her son's disease. Stinson is brought into surgery. The radial artery in his left forearm has been cut, and he's sustained lacerations around the mouth and chin. The impact of his fall has also re-injured his left knee, causing internal hemorrhage around the joint. He's lost considerable blood. On arrival at the hospital, he was given two units of anti-hemophilic plasma. He's approaching shock. Blood pressure, 70 over 40. Pulse? 160. The cut in his arm is sutured and a pressure bandage with fibrin foam applied. 
his face presents another problem. The lacerations are not as deep and can be easily sutured, but the application of a pressure bandage is extremely difficult in this area. Because the patient is a known hemophiliac, a cross match is run immediately and six units of fresh blood are ordered. The blood must be fresh for the vital protein anti-hemophilic factor, which is lacking in the patient's blood, the same protein which causes normal blood to coagulate, loses its effectiveness 24 hours after it's taken from the donor. In order to ensure a sufficient supply of fresh blood on hand, a call is sent out to all available sources in the area requesting blood of the patient's type. Meantime, outside in the hospital corridor, David's family waits, hopes, and prays. His father, mother, his sister. Her name's Flora. She's 21 years old. She's engaged to be married. Like her parents, this is hardly a new experience for her. She's been through it time and again. And with each new episode, a growing fear takes hold in her mind. A fear not only for her brother, but for herself. Three hours later, the patient is on his third unit of blood and is still bleeding. For the moment, the transfusions have removed the danger of shock. This makes 1,500 cc's. A sick boy. Seems there's enough AHF in the blood we've given him to induce clotting. Well, it's not quite that simple, Carl. Hemophiliacs not only lack the AHF factor in the blood, they tend to resist it. Sometimes one of them will build up antibodies that fight it, the one thing that can save their lives. I heard about a patient that took 30 transfusions and was still bleeding when he died. What about isolating the AHF? I mean, so it could be administered in massive doses. Has anybody tried it? No, it's been tried experimentally. It's not too reliable yet. So far, the best we've got is fresh blood and plasma. All we can do is what we are doing. I talked to George Fletcher, the hematologist. He agrees with the procedure we're following. If you want me for anything, I'll be outside getting a history from the parents. Tell them I'll be out as soon as I can. Right. Dr. Steiner, look at this. Is there any change? Well, he's shown some improvement since he came in, Mrs. Stinson. Nothing conclusive, but it's encouraging. I'd like to review David's uh, record, if I may. It's for the hospital records. Oh, surely. Hmm? Won't you sit down, please? Thank you. Hmm. Let's see now. Full name, David Carter Stinson. Sir. That's correct. Hmm. When was he born? March 10th, 1943. Hmm. Any childhood diseases? Chicken pox, measles. He never did have the mumps. And when was he first diagnosed as a hemophiliac? When he was five days old. We nearly lost him, didn't we, Rose? What about some of the other episodes? There were so many. The next time was when he was a year old. He began to walk. For most mothers, it's quite an event. I dreaded it. I watched him every second, never let him out of my sight. It happened anyway. He fell and cut his lip. He bled for three weeks. Do you remember how many transfusions he received, Mrs. Stinson? Quite a few. I, I don't remember how many. I know it was a lot. When we took him back home, I was scared to death. Scared every minute that he was awake. Scared to pick him up. Scared to touch him. Scared even to kiss him. After that, it seemed to get better. For two or three years, he was acting like most kids. Dr. Steiner said that's the way it was. Sometimes it was better, sometimes it was worse. I thought maybe it was over. Do you know of any uh, hemophilia in your family? I mean, did you ever know of any relatives that had it? No, no, I'd never even heard about it until Davy was born. They said... It came from me. I gave it to him. I didn't know about it. 
I never even heard about it. That's true, Sam, isn't it? I didn't know anything about it. Oh, of course not, darling. How could you? It wasn't your fault. It, it just happened. It's nobody's fault. When was the next time it showed up, Mrs. Stinson? Can you remember? When Davy was four, Sam bought him a rocking horse. It was beautiful. Its eyes rolled. It had skin like a real pony. Davy loved it. Then one afternoon he fell off. Got a bruise, a bad one. Was he hospitalized for that? He was in for over a month. Had to wear a brace. And five years ago, he had a very bad one. We went to Yosemite. Davy fell off a rock, he sprained his ankle. Oh, I know he shouldn't have gone there. I know he shouldn't have been on the rock. But how do you keep a kid chained up when he wants to run and jump with the rest of the kids? All you can do is hold him down until he looks at you like you were a policeman. Then you take a chance. You take a chance and then you're sorry for it. Flory saved his life. She was there when he fell. She was only 16, but she carried him all the way back to camp. We got a doctor. Rushed him to the small hospital in the park. Laurie and I took turns sitting up. She nursed him as though we were her own child, not her brother. It always surprises you. Kids understand more than you think. Excuse me. Excuse me, is there a phone? Just down the hall, other side of the elevators. Thank you. I'll be right back. Jimmy, this is Florrie. I'm still at the hospital. Yeah. I've got to see you, Jim. I've got to see you right away. Davy. We don't know yet. I'm sorry to call you out so late. That's okay. You sounded so funny on the phone, kind of scared me. What's it all about? What's the matter? Jimmy, are you really thinking about marrying me? Is that what you brought me down here for? Answer me. Do you really want to marry me? Well, I think so, Flory. I mean, well, we talked about it, you know. Later on. Gee, do, do we have to set the date right now? Do you really know what Davy's trouble is? Sure, he's kind of sickly. He, he gets hurt easy. He's a hemophiliac. Hmm? He's a bleeder. If we get married, if we have a baby, a boy, he could be just like Davy. Well, how come? You're from the same family. You didn't get it. No. I give it. Women aren't affected by it. They only give it. I'm a carrier. Well, how do you know? There's no way of knowing for sure. Not until I have a baby. But, but there must be some kind of a test. There must be some way of telling. There isn't. All I know is it's in the family blood. And it could be in mine. If I've got it, I could pass it on to my kids. Flory. You're probably worrying about nothing. You're probably perfectly all right. And if I'm not, would that be all right with you? Spend your life in hospital hallways. Have a kid you can't have any fun with. Watch him every minute of the day and night. Is that all right with you? Talk to my father. Ask him what it's like. 
Ask him how many times he's gotten phone calls at work. How many times he's come home and seen a crowd around the house and an ambulance waiting out in front. Ask him how many nights he's slept in the hospital waiting rooms like he's doing tonight. Sure, he wanted a son. It's what he always wanted. We finally got one. Davy. And what is he? A little kid. Almost like a glass doll. I'm propped up in a bed most of the time. You get so you're even afraid to touch him because you might start him bleeding. Is that the kind of a life you want? You want kids like that? Would that be all right with you? Do you want me that much? You better go home, Jimmy. I said you better go home. You're, you're all wrong. Seven hours later, and there's still no great change in the patient's condition. By now, there's every indication that this patient is a refractory case and may continue to bleed indefinitely. Blood pressure, 120 over 80. Pulse, 90. Both stable for the last four and a half hours. Transfusions of whole fresh blood continue. If they were to be stopped, it would be only a matter of time before the patient went into shock and died from loss of blood. pressure bandage is changed at regular intervals. Mind that, Carl. We won't need it now. Well, what is it? He stopped bleeding. He's so pale. He hardly seems to be breathing. He's all right. We have him under pretty heavy sedation. There's no need to wake his mother, is there? I don't think so. Not unless you want to. Eleven years old. He's the top of his class in school. They want him to make a speech when he graduates. He's a bright boy, Mr. Stinson. You ought to be proud of him. Is he going to live, Doctor? Well, he came out of it this time. If he's careful, no more accidents, no major cuts or bruises, he ought to make out pretty well for the time being, at least. Well, what about the future? Well, that's pretty hard to say. Well, what isn't hard to say? What can you tell me that I can take to his mother so she wakes up with a smile for just once in her life? Your boy's alive, Mr. Stinson. Twenty years ago, he'd have been dead. Alive? Alive for what? So he can spend his life in hospital beds with braces and wheelchairs? <laughs> I'd like to come outside, Mr. Stinson. We can talk about it there. What can you tell me outside that you can't tell me in here? I can tell you the truth. There's a man in Michigan and another one back in Massachusetts. They've isolated the protein in normal blood that your son lacks. There are a lot of problems with it. Maybe months, maybe years before it can be used clinically. But there it is. Somebody's doing something about David's trouble. Maybe tomorrow they'll find the answer. Maybe the day after. But they're going to go on looking for it. 
That's all I can tell you, Mr. Stinson. You've got a sick boy, but you're not alone with him. There are people working. And they're only humans. They've got to do a lot of work before they finally hit on the right answer. But when they do, they come up with insulin, sulfur, penicillin, the mycin drugs. Tomorrow, maybe a year from tomorrow, the man in Michigan or maybe the man back in Massachusetts, maybe they'll finally hit on the right answer. Kids like Davy can jump on their bikes and not worry about bumps and bruises. How about Davy? Does he have five years, doctor? Maybe five, maybe 50. You know, the graduation's in two weeks. He's supposed to make the speech. It's a big thing for him. Can he go? David Stinson, I, Rhonda Mead, is vice president of the graduating class of Jefferson Grammar School and proud to congratulate you on your achievement as honor student of the class of 1954. I now present our class president, Michael Elliott. David Stinson, I, Michael Elliott, as president of the graduating class of Jefferson Grammar School, am proud to congratulate you on your achievement as honor student of the class of 1954. Even though you were in attendance only 72 days during the school year, your record was outstanding and you were chosen valedictorian by the students and teachers of the class. It is my It is my privilege to present you with this award in token of your achievement. Thank you, Michael. And now I'd like to present our valedictorian, David Stinson. Thank you, Miss Walker. Miss Walker, fellow students, first, let me thank you for your gifts and for having elected me valedictorian. What does valedictorian mean? Valedictorian means the one who gives the valedictory. What does valedictory mean? Valedictory means of or pertaining to leave taking or saying goodbye. And we are saying goodbye. Goodbye to childish thoughts and actions, to jungle gyms and sandboxes, Hello to a new life of work and play at junior high. But we must be thinking of what kind of men and women we will want to be in the far future of 10 years from now. We must ask ourselves, what does the future hold for me? Flory, I've been waiting for you. I'm late, Jimmy. It's Davy's graduation. I wish you'd listen to me first. It's important. It's been two weeks, Flory. I haven't seen you. I haven't called you. I suppose you thought I was trying to ditch you. Well, I'm not. You gave me a lot to think about, Davy and all this hemophilia stuff. Well, I thought about it. I thought about every angle. It's time, Flory. I guess we gotta grow up. A month ago, we were kids. We're not kids anymore. We both know the score. Well, that's all there is to it. I love you. I want to marry you. I want to have kids. I want to be with you. That's all I've got to say. What do you think? Well, I'm glad we got that settled. Which way is Davy's room? Come with me. And so, fellow students, I say this is the most exciting time to be alive. Each of us, in his own way, was prepared to face his own future. Yes, nothing is impossible for those who have faith in the future. Fellow classmates, the world is our oyster. At the present time, research teams at hematological centers all over the country are at work attempting to find the cause and cure for hemophilia, the hereditary disease which lies passive in the female genes of a family for generations and then strikes the innocent with tragic force. Through the steps made by modern medicine to date, by transfusion of whole fresh blood and anti-hemophilic plasma, the lifespan of a hemophiliac has been increased from a few short years to an almost normal and useful period. There is no cure for hemophilia yet, but someday in the near future, a hemophiliac may be able to control his disease by injection, much like the injection of insulin for diabetes. <laughs>